But this morning's topic, I do want to talk about Islam, and I want to talk specifically about the Quran, and the title of my message this morning is, is basically based on my newest book, What the Quran Really Teaches About Jesus. Let, let me preface by saying, before I look at specifics, listen, we need to get a handle on Islam. We need to love the Muslim people. We have an unprecedented opportunity. Let me tell you, Islam in the last 10 years, according to our latest census in the U.S., grew by 160% in the United States just in 10 years. Uh, we have many, many international uh, people that are coming here who are Muslim from various countries. And what a wonderful opportunity to build a relationship, to, share, to, to build a gospel, to have a gospel conversation. Uh, this is a mission field that does not require an airplane or a visa. Uh, they come to us, and if we're prepared and equipped to love people, we can share the gospel with, with, with Muslims. And I want to talk about that, specifically what the Quran uh, really teaches about Jesus. Here, here's the premise. I'm convinced if, you, if we know just a couple of key passages in the Quran, we can turn that and ask questions and share that passage in a way of helping the Muslim to get into a gospel conversation with us, to transition them to the Bible to see what the gospel says, what the gospels say, what the New Testament says about those same questions and issues. And I, I want to equip you to do that. Let me just give, before I look at specifics, let me just give you one example of how this, how I see this working out for you. What the Quran really teaches about Jesus. I was at a coffee shop, Starbucks, near my office back in Texas, Arlington, Texas, and my office is just a block from the University of Texas at Arlington, and we have thousands and thousands of Muslim students on campus, and I was at the nearby Starbucks right there, and a guy came in, and I, and I go there fairly regularly, and I had seen, I thought, seen him before, but I never talked with him, but I noticed two important things this guy walks into the Starbucks that day. First of all, I noticed that he was carrying an Islamic dictionary. And the first thing I thought, okay, he must be Muslim. Second thing I noticed, there's only one empty seat in the entire Starbucks, right next to me. Now, on this particular event, I, I actually cheated a little bit on this one. I, I was just reading my Bible, but as I saw him get his drink and come over in my direction toward the chair, I just quickly closed the Bible and opened the Quran, started reading Quran. I didn't say a word. I didn't have to. Sure enough, he hadn't been sat, sat down up not 10, 15 minutes, I feel him hit me on the shoulder. He said, oh, you're reading Quran. I said, yes, I, yes, I am. He said, oh, you must be Muslim. I said, no, actually, I'm Christian. He said, huh? <laughs> I said, I'm Christian, but I really want to understand from a Christian perspective about the Quran and understand more about it. And in fact, in fact, uh, I was actually reading a passage that I'm having a lot of questions about. He said, oh, I'm Muslim. I will help you. And so I, I, I read to him this passage, and you might want to put this, go ahead and get this in your notes, because this is a great opening conversation. I said, I'm reading here in chapter 3, Surah 3, verse 50. In Surah 3, verse 50, Jesus is speaking in the Quran, and he says, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, so fear Allah and obey me. Jesus says, you must fear Allah, you must obey him, Jesus. He said, that's right, my friend, you must fear Allah, you must obey Isa." That's their word for Jesus. You must obey Jesus. I said, well, here's my question. I'm reading through the Quran, but I'm having a problem. I cannot find any of the commands of Jesus. If we're to obey Jesus, what did he tell us to do? I'm unable to find that in the Quran. Now, this kind of surprised me. He actually took the iPad out of my hand. Let me see. And he starts looking through. He goes, mm, my friend, he said, no, I, I don't see them either. But I tell you what, he said, I have some friends who are Quranic scholars. I will talk, discuss with them. I will bring back you a list of the commands of Jesus in the Quran. I said, that would be great. I really appreciate that. We talked about other things in the conversation. I kind of changed gears. And I kind of forgot about it till about maybe a week or maybe 10 days later. I was in the same Starbucks and I saw him come in. And he came in. I, I, I got his attention, waved. He waved at me. And so he naturally came over, bought his coffee. We sat down again. We talked about a bunch of other stuff. But it got around to this, and I said, you know, uh, remember when we talked the first time, uh, I, I was having problems with that Surah 350 about the commands of Jesus, and you had some scholars who were going to give you a list. He, oh, yes, yes, the list of the commands of Jesus. He said, uh, they could not find them either. <laughs> I said, I was thinking about that. 
Where else would you find the commands of Jesus? We must look in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of course. Now, he, he is, and you'll, you'll get this as well. There was immediate pushback. Oh, no, no, my, the Gospels have been corrupted. I said, well, but even if, let's say, they were corrupted, is there anything still of value there? Let me ask you, what have you found of value still in the Gospels? Have you read the Gospels? He said, no, I've never read them. They're not in my language. Now, I'm thinking he seems to speak awfully good English. <laughs> I didn't go there, though. I just said, I just said, oh, well, well, tell me, my friend, what is your language? He said, Urdu. I'm from Pakistan, Urdu. I said, you know, I, I just kind of think there probably is a gospel of Matthew in Urdu. And I just Googled it right there on my, my tablet. I said, look what I found. And I showed, I said, is that actually Urdu? He looked at it, it's Urdu. I said, the gospel of Matthew in Urdu. I said, tell you what. Why don't you read? Why don't we do this together? You read Matthew's gospel and then and I will read again. And the next time we talk, we can see if we find any of the commands of Jesus that the Quran talked about and see what Jesus commands us to do. Would you like to do that? He goes, oh, no. He says, I know this. I, no, no, no. We make a deal. You must first read Surah 2. And he gave me I don't remember the other one. He gave me two chapters. He wanted me to read from the Quran. So I said, okay, you're saying if I read the two chapters of the Quran, you're going to read Matthew. He said, yes. Will you do it? I said, it's a deal. Let's do it. And so let me tell you, over the next probably uh, six, nine months, we had, we had probably a, about a half dozen to a dozen good, long conversations because it opened the door. What do you find in Matthew's gospel? Okay, well, what do you think the commands are that we must do to have our sins forgiven? Have you done those commands yet? And so we talked about these kind of things, developed a friendship, and it all started with one simple question to ask out of the Quran. And it launched a transition into the New Testament and all kinds of discussions about who Jesus really is. So that kind of gives you an example of how it works. This is the, the premise behind what the Quran really teaches about Jesus. But this, the message this morning, let me tell you, before we look at anything the Quran says about Jesus, it's important to remember what does the Bible really teach about Jesus. Let's start with the truth. Turn, if you will, with me to John's Gospel, uh, chapter 20. What does the Bible really teach about Jesus? John's Gospel, chapter 20, beginning in verse 24. By the way, this is a picture of my friend, Muslim, there in the Starbucks reading the Gospel of Matthew in Urdu for the very first time in his own heart language. That's, there he is right there. So John's Gospel, chapter, chapter 20, verse 24, it says this, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, that means twin, was not with them when Jesus came. Now this, if you don't remember, this is the, the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. Jesus has died on the cross, according to John's Gospel. He was buried. He rose again victoriously from the grave. He's seen by the disciples, but the problem was Thomas wasn't with them at the time. So this is a subsequent meeting, and this time they're gathered together, but now Thomas is with them. And it says in uh, verse 25, The other disciples therefore came to him, said to him, rather, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Except I see in his hand the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, we all, this is why we call him Doubting Thomas. But, you know, we, we're critical of him. But isn't there a little bit of Doubting Thomas in all of us? I mean, it's kind of like I, I could kind of see that. I, I could see myself being skeptical, wanting to see. The other disciples, all my buddies got to see. How come I didn't get to see, right? Well, it's interesting that Jesus accommodates this. So in this appearance, Thomas is there. And it says in verse 26, I will not believe, uh, verse uh, 26. And after eight days again, his disciples were with him, and Thomas, um, Thomas with them, here, sorry, Thomas with them, then came Jesus to the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, what? Peace be unto you. He then said to Thomas, so this is his accommodation, he's giving Thomas the chance to actually not be doubting Thomas. And he says to him, verse 27, then said he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hand. 
my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but be believing. Verse 28. And Thomas answered and said to him unto him, my Lord and my God. Look at the reaction of Thomas to seeing the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God, he said. Jesus, verse 29, says, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are those, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Yet believed what? That Jesus died on the cross, that he was buried, that he rose victoriously from the dead, and he is physically risen from the dead. More blessed is those who don't see and yet believe. Uh, verse uh, 30. And many other signs truly Jesus did in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31. But these are written. Now, this is the very purpose of the writing of John's gospel. But these are written that you might believe that Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by, by believing, that believing, you may have life through his name. The very purpose of John's gospel is that you would believe what? That Jesus is the Son of God, that he died and rose again, and that by believing, listen, heaven and hell comes down to what we believe about this. The very purpose of John's gospel. All these things we're going to see in a moment categorically get denied in the Quran. The very purpose of the gospel. Uh, the the, the uh, gospel. So what we want to do this, this, this morning is I want to just take you through very briefly, give you a couple of examples from the book of what we need to know. What we want to do is we want to talk about what the Quran affirms about Jesus. Now, remarkably, the Quran actually agrees with the Bible in some places. Uh, the, the Muslim has a very deep disrespect, uh, a very deep respect for Jesus. Uh, we're going to see uh, what the Quran says about that. Um, but we're also going to, too, in your outline, we're going to talk about what the Quran denies. Make no mistake about it. The Jesus of the Quran is not the Jesus of the Bible. We're going to see examples of that in a moment. Uh, trust me on this. And then we're going to talk about three. What is our task? What are we going to do about it? What can we do to share the gospel uh, with the Muslim people? So let's first of all talk about number one in your outline, what the Quran affirms. One of the most important things to start with, I think, is that, A, in your outline, the Quran does affirm that Jesus is a prophet. So Jesus is a prophet. They, they, um, uh, there's a lot of, again, respect for Jesus. They believe that he, he, his birth was prophesied by the other prophets, uh, that, uh, uh, that, he, that he gave forth prophecies in the name of God. Um, we find um, the, uh, the Quran itself. Let me share with you from Surah 2, verse 136, what it says about Jesus. Say, O Muslims, we believe in Allah and that which is revealed unto us and that which was revealed unto Abraham and to Ishmael and to Isaac and to Jacob and to the tribes. You talk about the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, basically, the, the Quran's affirming the biblical prophets. It, it, it affirms elsewhere Adam is a prophet. And so uh, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, Ishmael, all, all these are prophets of God. Uh, that, ha, and that which Moses and Jesus received from their Lord. And look at this key. We make no distinction between any of them. The, the, the Quran affirms all the prophets, including Jesus, and makes no distinction between Muhammad, Jesus, Abraham. They're all equal from God prophets in the sight of the Quran. And we're going to we're going to address that in a moment. We make no distinction between them and unto him we have surrendered. Now, one of the best questions to ask when you're dealing with this verse, Muslims going to affirm. Yes, we of course, we believe Jesus was a prophet of God. Great question to ask. What did Jesus prophesy? If he's a prophet of God, what did he prophesy? Now, like the commands of Jesus, interestingly, there's not one prophecy of Jesus recorded anywhere in the Quran. Is how do you have a prophet if you have no prophecies to go with it? How can you affirm he's a true prophet? Don't you have to at least have one prophecy to go on to see if he's a true or a false prophet? But we do have many, many prophecies of Jesus in the Bible. So what does the Bible really teach about Jesus when it comes to prophecy? Uh, in Mark's gospel, we find this. Um, and they departed thence and passed through Galilee. And he would not that any man should know it, for he taught his disciples and said to them, 
the Son of Man, look at this, is delivered unto the hands of men, and they, will, they shall kill him, and after he is killed, he shall rise the third day. So what did Jesus prophesy? The very thing denied in the Quran. He, did, he prophesied his death, his betrayal, his death, his burial, and his resurrection three days later. All of these are prophecies of Jesus. So what did Jesus uh, prophesy? Now, when you, when you share that verse with them and talk about one of Jesus' prophecy, and the Muslim sees that they know that this is not uh, according to the Quran, you'll usually get the pushback. Well, yes, but we can't trust the Bible. We can't trust the Gospels because they have been corrupted. Yeah, what, you, what you're going to see in the book is the, the approach that I take is ask the right questions. A, a, a question is sometimes much better than an argument or, uh, or, or to challenge. Just say, well, that's interesting. And a great question to ask, if, if the Bible has been corrupted, if we can't trust it's been corrupted, can I ask you a question? When was the Bible corrupted? When was the Bible corrupted? Was it corrupted before Muhammad or was it corrupted at, after Muhammad? Now, both of these propositions are very problematic. Let me deal with the first one. The Muslim can't really say that the Bible was corrupted before the life of Muhammad. And here's why. Repeatedly throughout the Quran, we're instructed, if you have questions or doubts about the message of Muhammad, go to the book. Ask the people of the book. Now, the book it's talking about is the Bible. The people it's talking about of the book are the Jews and the Christians. So, for example, you find this in Surah 10, verse 94. If you have doubts, ask the people of the book. That would be the Old and the New Testament. Well, why would God send you to a book that's been corrupted? Obviously, the book could not have been corrupted before the lifetime of Muhammad. So perhaps they could argue, well, maybe it was after. We can't go to the book, people of the book today because after the life of Muhammad, at some point, the, the Bible became corrupted. Well, there's a real problem with arguing that after the Bible was corrupted after Muhammad because we have... Uh, a rich history of textual evidence of the authenticity and the accuracy of the of the both Old and New Testament. Many, many uh, hundreds of manuscripts predating the life of Muhammad in the 6th century A.D. A example, you have the John Ryland Library and you have Papyrus uh, P-52, which is a fragment of John's Gospel that dates to about 150 A.D., give or take. It actually, ironically, is, a, is a, a, a portion of a verse that's actually talking about uh, Jesus uh, being resurrected. And so you, you have manuscript evidence validating that the Bible that we have today is, is, uh, goes back way before the life of Muhammad. A, a better example, even before the life of Christ, you have the Dead Sea Scrolls and the, and the famous great Isaiah scroll, where you have the whole suffering servant prophesied that Jesus that the, the, the suffering servant would, be, uh, would, would uh, suffer for our transgressions, that he would be wounded for our sins, for our transgression, and that the, 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 the sins of us would be laid on him, all clearly laid out, not just before the life of Muhammad, before the life of Jesus. So we know that the Bible that we have today, and that we have strong manuscript evidence, is very accurate, way before the... the before the life of Muhammad. And so, again, when was, the, when, when was the New Testament corrupted? When was the Old Testament corrupted? Either, either explanation is very problematic, I believe, for the Muslim. Now, a second thing I want you to see that the, that the Quran affirms, be in your outline, the Quran um, remarkably affirms that Jesus was born of a virgin. Uh, born of a virgin. Uh, let me share you with you from Surah 19, verse 22 in the Quran. The Quran says it this way. She said, this is, this is Mary. She said, how can I have a son when no man has touched me, nor am I unchaste? He said, so it will be, your Lord said, it is easy for me, Allah. And we wish to appoint him, this is Jesus, as a sign to mankind and a mercy from us. It is a matter already decreed by Allah, verse 22. So she conceived him, and she withdrew to him to a far place. And it says, parenthetically, this is Bethlehem, near Jerusalem. So uh, the Quran affirms that Jesus was uh, born of a virgin. Now, again, sometimes the Muslim will beat you to this. They're going to show you in the Quran 
this place of commonality. Oh, look, we, we say a lot of good things about Jesus. We too believe he was born of a virgin. Or sometimes you're the one who brings it up and asks them about it. They will affirm it. There's no secret to the Muslim. They know Jesus was born of a virgin according to Quran. It's a great question to ask. Let me ask you, my friend, how many other prophets were born of a virgin? No other prophet, not in the Quran, not anywhere. Do you have a prophet born of a virgin? Um, Abraham was not born of a virgin. Isaac, Ishmael, King David, no, no, no virgin birth. Mohammed, no virgin birth. Jesus only. So they say they make no distinction between the prophets. But do we see a big distinction between the prophets? No other prophet was born of a virgin. Now, the way they interpret this, and the Quran itself interprets it, they believe that Jesus was virgin born, but not God, not deity. Um, and they believe that, that uh, God created um, Jesus in the womb. So they have a different understanding of that. My point is, you do have a huge distinction between Jesus, that we would agree, yes, Jesus was a prophet, but my argument is he's much more than just a prophet. And we're going to talk about that as we look at what the Quran denies. Two in your outline, uh, what the Quran denies about Jesus. Uh, by, the, by the way, Isaiah 7, 14 is where we find the, um, the Bible teaches also that Jesus was born of a virgin. So two in your outline, what the Quran denies about Jesus. Uh, a, uh, first of all, the Quran denies Jesus as the Son of God, clearly teaching that Jesus is not the Son of God. Now, let me, first of all, remind you that in Luke's gospel, well, throughout the New Testament, uh, Jesus is showing in the Gospels, claiming to be the Son of God. For example, in uh, Luke 22, what does the Bible really teach about Jesus? Uh, Luke 22, beginning in verse 70. Then they, uh, then they all, then said they all, Art thou the son of God? There's the very question. Jesus is on trial. He's being asked, are you, are you not the son of God? And he answered to them, ye say that I am. He affirms it. Verse 71. And they said, what need we of any further witness? For we have ourselves heard, have heard of his own mouth. So Jesus clearly claims to be the son of God. In the Quran, however, we find that that's not the case whatsoever. In the Quran, Surah 448, for example, says this. Verily, Allah forgives not that partners should be set up with him. Now, let me say this before I read the rest of the verse to you. It's not just in the Islam that Jesus is not the son of God. No, no, this is a much bigger issue. This is a huge deal. If Jesus is the son of God, the Quran makes the case, and, and I kind of agree you're implying equality here. If you're the son of a, of a cat, if you're a kitten, what are you? You're cat. If you're the son of God, what are you? You know, you're, you're, you're making that claim. And so the Quran says this, you're, you're creating a partner with God. This is what's called in Islam, the sin of shirk. And it's tantamount to the unpardonable sin. And this is the way the Quran says it. Verily, Allah forgives not. You will not be forgiven. That partners should be set up with Allah, with God, with him in worship. But he forgives except that. He forgives other things. Except what? Except that anything else to whom he wills and whomever sets up partners with Allah in worship, he has indeed invented a tremendous sin. So, Jesus cannot be the son of God because it implies deity and it implies a partnership. Let me uh, resolve some, some real apparent um, um, confusion I think we have in our culture. Now, we hear this from the news media a lot. We hear it from some of our even top politicians. The idea that because Islam is a monotheistic religion and Christianity is a monotheistic religion, that means both religions believe there's only one true God Here's their conclusion. That means both religions worship the same God. I'm convinced that Allah of Quran is not the God of the Bible. And one example of this is this whole idea of, of, of that Jesus cannot be the son of God. Some Muslims will actually push this agenda as well. 
And they'll say, oh, but, we, but my friend, we all believe in the same one true God. I'll say, well, actually, the God I worship is the father of my Lord Jesus Christ. Now, is that the God you're talking about? Well, no, they can't set up a partnership. This is the unforgivable part. Uh, unforgiven, uh, forgivable part. And you find B in your outline, it leads right into the second doctrine, logically. If Jesus is not the son of God, he also cannot be the second person of the Trinity. So the Quran denies that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. The type of monotheism of, of Islam is technically called uh, dynamic monarchianism. One God and only one person is God. In Christianity, we have a, a monotheism that's Trinitarian monotheism. We would say one true God, three distinct persons. This is a different whole concept of God. And I, one of the things that I do in the book, and we actually have this available also in, in DVD, is I've done several debates with Khalil Meek, the president of the Muslim Legal Fund of America. Our most recent debate, the, um, the, the uh, topic was Jesus Christ, prophet of Allah or savior of the world. And the whole thing of the doctrine of the Trinity comes up and this idea of this being an unforgivable, unpardonable sin by setting up this partnership, this shirk came out in the debate. So let me just let you hear from Khalil Meek, the president of the Muslim Legal Fund, in my debate with him as he explains uh, this concept of Taweed or oneness and why it's not compatible with Trinitarianism. Tawheed. And Tawheed means pure monotheism, like the complete oneness in reference to God. God has no equals, no partners, nothing's worthy of worship except Allah, nothing's worthy of praise but Allah. Allah has power over all things. Everything is a dependent upon Allah. Allah is not dependent on anything. Allah is perfect, supreme, sovereign. Allah deserves all reverence, worship, praise, respect, and devotion. Again, if you can touch it, taste it, see it, smell it, it is not Allah. If you can touch it, taste it, feel it, smell it, it's not Allah, that means Jesus cannot be God either. And so, again, this is something that the Quran denies, and this is something... Let me tell you, the, the, the temptation we're going to have is when the, when the Quran affirms things that we also agree with, and we can talk about that, gives us some common ground, that's a great way to start a conversation. The temptation is to stop there. Well, you're not building a bridge if you stop there. You're, you're just building a monument. Now, to build a bridge, you've got to talk about the things we don't agree on. And you, you want to introduce a way of doing that by speaking the truth in love. So uh, Jesus is not the second person of the Trinity. The Quran says it this way. O people of the scriptures, it's talking about Christians. O people of the scriptures, this is Surah 4. Do not exceed the limits in your religion, nor say of Allah, aught but the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Miriam, Mary, was no more than a messenger of Allah in his word. How, was he, how did he come into existence? Allah said, be, and he was, which he bestowed on Miriam and a spirit created by him. So believe in Allah and in his messenger. Say not three, Trinity, cease. It is better for you. For Allah is the one, is the only Allah, God. Glory be to him, far exalted is he above having a son. Surely disbelievers are those who have said Allah is the third of the three in a trinity. But there is no Allah, God, none who has the right to be worshipped, but one Allah, God, Allah. And if they cease not from, the, that, uh, from what they say, verily a painful torment will befall on the uh, disbelievers among them. The Quran has a lot to say about hell and the torments of hell. And this is uh, tantamount to the unpardonable sin. So as you're talking about who Jesus really is, you're going to get uh, you're going to have to at some point deal with the doctrine of the Trinity and uh, to help them understand what we're not saying. Let me say some Muslims, especially I've noticed some international Muslims, they have a misconception. They think that we're, when we talk about Trinity, we're talking about three um, that are God, that you have uh, Allah, the father, Mary, the wife of God. And then you have their son, Jesus. That's what we're talking about when we say Holy Trinity, that God is married. The, the idea that being, having a son implies some kind of consort or wife that would be required. That's not what we're saying with the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, or they'll try to say, well, we can prove, disprove the Trinity 
merely mathematically. Obviously, there can only be one who is God, one who is Allah, because there's only one God. And do the math, my friend. One plus one plus one equals three, not one. Well, that proves nothing. I mean, you could say, well, let's do the math. One times one times one equals what? <laughs> one. That, that proves nothing. Help them, first of all, understand what we, say, what we mean when we say Trinity. We're meaning that there's only one true God who eternally exists as three distinct persons. They'll say, but, but how could Jesus pray to himself? We're not saying the same person. We're not saying one God, one person. We're saying one God, three persons. One what, three who's. You could say it that way. Just help them understand. I did my second debate with Khalil Meek at the University of Central Oklahoma in uh, uh, Edmond, Oklahoma. And uh, this particular debate was co-sponsored by the Muslim Student Association. They co-moderated it. We had almost as many Muslims there as, as Christians. And after the debate, one of the Muslims who wasn't one of the students there but heard about it and, and came to attend came up to me and said, uh, he said, this was so enlightening to me. I never understood until tonight what you mean what, when you say Trinity. I'm not a Christian, but I understand now exactly what you mean when you say Trinity. About nine months later, I, got, uh, I was contacted that that Muslim young man has become a Christian now. So what I'm saying is these kind of conversations, before you reject something, at least, at least understand what you're rejecting. We're not saying that Jesus and the Father are the same person. Or you'll get this... Uh, this uh, uh, defense from the Muslim. It's too complicated. I want a simple God. I don't understand how the one can be three and the three can be one. It's too com It can't be true. It's too complicated. Well, my friend, just because something is hard to understand doesn't mean necessarily it's not true. Uh, how many of you seen the video of the, the huge cargo planes? They weigh hundreds of tons. They get going on the runway, but the interesting thing, the faster they go, the lighter they get. The lighter, faster, faster, lighter, until they're finally so light, they actually flutter away like a leaf. You don't believe that, do you? Now, before you go home and say, James doesn't believe planes fly. I believe planes fly. I don't understand how they fly. Now, I've had, now John, I'm a, he, he's a pilot. He can explain to me. Lift drag coefficient, right? Aerodynamics and... The, the top of the wing is further along than the bottom. There's more, there's more surface, which creates a suction. I still don't believe it. I shouldn't say I don't believe it. Of course I believe planes fly. I'm going to get on one tomorrow. I don't understand. Now, could the God who created the heavens and the earth be more complex than an airplane? I would hope so. Now, I'm just saying, just because we can't wrap our finite brains around something doesn't mean... In fact, in fact, I'd be very suspicious of any God you could fully understand and explain. Uh, I can explain idols. I can't explain the true God. So what we're saying when we say Trinity, we're saying that the Bible says three things about God and we agree with all three of them. The Bible uh, affirms there's only one true God. The Bible affirms the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all called God. Yet the Bible also affirms that the Father, Son, and Spirit are distinct persons, not the same person. So we would say affirming all these truths that within the nature of the one true God, there eternally exists three distinct persons. Please remember in uh, John's gospel, uh, John 20, 28, what did Thomas say? Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Don't miss this. What did, when, G, when Thomas sees the resurrected Christ, he affirms as, as both the Lord of me and the God of me. Now, if Islam was true, Jesus should have responded how? He, sh he should have, he had this unpardonable sin. He should have corrected them. Instead, he blessed Thomas and said, even more blessed are those who don't see and yet believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Well, see in your outline, Jesus was not crucified as well. Um, I won't go through the passages with you on that right away, uh, uh, right now for the sake of time. But let me just say, that um, the Quran doesn't actually explain what happened to Jesus. It leaves a mystery. The Quran says they thought they had crucified him, but indeed they crucified him not. Now, the theories of what happened to Jesus, Jesus. Now, again, why is this important? You lose the crucifixion, you lose the resurrection. You lose the resurrection, you lose your salvation. Our salvation is in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the core of the gospel. So what happened if Jesus wasn't crucified? 
In the Hadith, in the centuries that followed the death of Muhammad, there were Muslim theories that came to light. And there are several theories, but before we look at those theories, you have to understand this is not an eyewitness account. This is not written by an eyewitness account. The Muslim apologist Shabir Ali, when he does debates, he regularly criticizes the New Testament because he says it may have been written several decades after the event it describes. In other words, it's not trustworthy. Several decades after the events it describes. Well, when was the Quran written? You know, you're talking about something that was written not several decades. You're talking about something that was written uh, 600 years later, over 800 miles away by someone who had never even read the New Testament, wasn't even claiming to be an eyewitness. But somehow that's to be more reliable. And then who died on the cross if it wasn't Jesus? Now, this brings up an interesting theories that you get. Who was it that died on the cross? Uh, one of the theories that you have is uh, the, the prominent theory is there was a substitute who died on the cross. I call this the stunt double theory. So the stunt double gets up there on the cross and there's several theories who it was. There was a mix up. Some say that the, a wrong disciple was accidentally placed on the cross. There was a mix up. Another theory is it was Simon of Cyrene. Remember the guy who carried the cross beam to, the, to Calvary? Wrong place, wrong time. Mix up, he, he was, oh, he's carrying it. Let's put him up on the cross. So it's Simon of Cyrene. Uh, the other, one of the other theories is that the likeness of the face of Jesus is placed on one of the other disciples, the similitude of Jesus. But the most prominent theory today, you're not going to believe this. The one who dies on the cross is actually Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot dies for and on behalf of Jesus as a substitute. Talking about turning the atonement on its head. Now you have G Judas becoming the, the substitutionary atonement for Jesus. Again, not an eyewitness account. And it still doesn't answer the question. In my first debate with, with Khalil, this came up in the debate. You watch the DVD. Uh, what about the empty tomb? How do you explain that the tomb, you, you know that if, if the Romans or the Jews could have produced the body of Jesus Christ, they would have dragged that corpse up and down the streets of Jerusalem and instantly ended this, this whole new religion. Why didn't they? The tomb was empty, my friend. Now, the, the Muslim answer, oh, well, but it was a substitute who died on the cross. Where's the body of the substitute? Produce a body for me. They couldn't. Why? Because he is not here. He is risen indeed. Very, very powerful uh, apologetic for the, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me end up with, wrap it up with one more example. And this is, this is the most, I, I think, tragic to me of all the examples of denials of the Quran. The Quran denies that Jesus is the savior of the world, teaching Jesus is not the savior of the world. Surah 4, we find this. And there is none of the people of the scriptures, Jew and Christian, but must believe in him, Isa, Jesus, son of Miriam, as only a messenger of Allah and a human being before his um, death at the time of the appearance of the angel of death. And on the day of resurrection, he will be a witness against them. If you say Jesus is more than a mere man, if you say he's, he's the son of God, if you say he's your savior of the world, then, then he's going to actually be brought up to testify against you on the judgment day. Jesus himself will be brought to testify against you according to the Quran. Uh, again, a good question to ask when this comes up in the conversation. Quran is clear that Jesus is not the savior of the world. The, the, here's the question to ask. It's a very, very sobering question. Well, if Jesus is not the savior, may I ask you a question? Who is the savior of the world? And this is the tragedy. There is no savior in Islam. Let me take you in the back of my book. I interview some Muslims who have recently come to Christ. What was it about Jesus in the Quran that when you met the real Jesus and saw the difference, how did this help you make your journey to Christianity from Islam? And one example, I'll share, share you a little video clip here, a, a, a quick example. This is Zia Hassan from Pakistan, a, a friend of mine uh, who is now a Christian. And here's how he answered that question. In Islam, in the Quran or in Islam, if Jesus is not the savior of the world. Is there even a savior? Who's the savior then? There is no savior. They don't believe anything is savior. You have to do your own. You have to perform. Your, you have to do yourself to get to the God. There's no, there's no such a concept in Islam being a savior. 
On the day of judgment, you stand naked before a holy God, dead in your trespasses and sins, with no mediator, no savior, hoping that somehow Allah may decide to save you anyway in your sin. In the great scale of justice, they say that God puts all your good deeds on one side, all your bad deeds on the other. If the bad deeds outweigh the good deeds, you will go straight to hell. Let me tell you, there's not one Muslim I've ever met who has an assurance of salvation. How could you? Because you have no savior. Um, what is our task? Just fill in the blanks, and the book goes through this in much more detail. Four things we want to do, T-A-S-K, talk. We want to talk, build a relationship with Muslims. Please don't be so afraid of Muslims that you don't realize these are people for whom Christ died. They can make great friends. Uh, you want to be able to love the Muslim people. You don't have to agree with Islam to love the Muslim people. Uh, ask them to read one of the Gospels. One of the main things I push for in the book is try to transition them to get them exposed. Most Muslims have never read the story of the woman at the well. They've never read the story of, of Nicodemus. Uh, they, they've, they're unfamiliar with this. Just to get them exposed, the power, my friend, is in God's word. Let's get them into God's word. Uh, spend that time and be patient. This is not something that one verse is going to do the trick or one strong argument. Most good apologetics and evangelism is built on relationship, not on having a, a, uh, a perfect argument, uh, not, not by uh, winning, winning the argument. And uh, know the right questions to ask. Again, a lot of the book is knowing good questions to ask when this comes up. Uh, so let me just ask the question as we close out. Is it worth it? Should we try to reach the Muslim people? Listen, I, I can't, I'm out of time to tell you examples, but let me tell you, we have reports all over the world of Muslims coming to Christ. I'm convinced no time in the history of Islam have more Muslims become Christians than right now. I want to be part of that. And one of the, one of the interviews that I did, is the transcript is in the book, is a story of um, Samara. And Samara was a, was a student, a Muslim student, came to the university and got some Christian friends on campus who started sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with her. Let me just close with this little video clip where, where Samara is going to tell you it was worth it to her. And then he said, I want you to be in heaven with me. I said, that's new. That's, I've never heard of that before. I looked at the Bible differently. I was, I was, I was having sincere questions. We would have Bible studies every, every, I would not miss my Bible studies every single week for two hours. We would study that, and then I would go back home and just pray about it. Let me ask you this. Were you dreading those meetings with, with, with Wes's dad, or were you kind of in your heart looking forward to seeing what's going to be next? It was like that. It was what's going to be next. Okay, uh, I, I cannot defend Islam anymore. This is not the God that I know, and he could not be this. He just could not be the unloving God. There was a lot of evidence for me to avoid. There was a lot of evidence and the and the and the gospel and the Bible to say, oh, ignore that. I just couldn't do that anymore. Let me ask you to stand, if you will, with your heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment. If if you don't know the Jesus that Zamara was talking about, if you're here and 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 maybe you're a visitor, maybe you maybe you're a member here, but you you've had doubts or questions about about God or about his, his, uh, his son and, and about the gospel. We don't want you to leave here today without knowing the joy that Zamara and, and most all of us have experienced of knowing that our sins have been forgiven. Our sins have been forgiven because although we're sinners, God loves us. And he gave us a, a, a way of being right with him, not by our goodness, uh, but while we were yet sinners, God loved us and Christ died for us. And he offers that if we will turn from our sin and put our faith and trust in him. I want to invite you to do that today. Uh, let me ask you a question with your heads bowed and eyes closed. How many of you know a Muslim? Raise your hand if you can tell me the name of a Muslim today that you personally know, almost all of us. God might be touching your heart to want to build that relationship, that friendship with a Muslim, that Muslim that you personally know. I want to invite you in just a moment to come down to the front and just kneel down and pray and say, God, here I am, use me. Help me stand in the gap. I want to be used and other Christians to use to reach this Muslim. I want to pray for them by name. You might want to do that down at the front and just kneel down and pray for that person by name. 
that God, some of, you, of us who don't have Muslim friends, say, God, would you give me a Muslim that I could share my testimony with what you've done in my life that I could build a friendship with? If God's touching you, we want to give you a chance to respond. Whatever, whatever decision God might be laying on your heart, we want you to say yes to God right now. I'm going to be down at the front to pray with you as well. If God's touching your heart and life, please say yes to God right now.